And good evening and welcome to City Focus. I'm Marty Olson, your host. And you know, every week when I open, I've got a terrific guest and a special guest. And tonight I've got an extra special guest, a gentleman who I've known basically my entire life, uh, going back to kindergarten, harbor school, and uh, he's been involved. Uh, we've, we've interwoven on and off forever. Seems like. At, at, uh, for different reasons, and uh, uh, his family is well known in the community. They ran a car dealership up on uh, used, Broad used Street. To be, used to be, sadly. Yep. Uh, but I'd like to welcome Glenn Linder to the program. And, and Glenn, thank you for carving out an hour to spend on the program. <clears throat> well, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's nice being back in the old homestead again, and uh, I see what you guys have put together here. This is pretty cool. Well, every week uh, with City Focus, we have a little fun, and my guest... The range is all over the place. I mean, anybody who's got a story, uh, we, as much as I've been an active in politics and you've been active in some of my campaigns, Indeed. Uh, Indeed. it is a, a program that's primarily community-focused, New London-centric, but I've had the uh, privilege of having some folks that have come in from out of the area to sit in the seat where you are uh, on, on a variety of different topics, whether it be sports or uh, academics, <clears throat> anything, social services, promoting things, promote the community. And, uh, and, and you are uh, a real literal pro in your field here that uh, we've got you as an actor and you are also do voiceovers I do. and you've done radio. I have. And uh, I know you've done radio for me. Yeah, I've done that a few times. And th that has been terrific. And in preparation for the program, uh, Glenn fired me off a, a photograph. Uh, and, I, and I didn't know this, but uh, as a barkeep in the movie Goodfellas. Yeah, I managed to sneak onto that set somehow. I think a lot of folks locally never knew about that and uh, never knew how that all happened. And uh, all of a sudden, as about six months ago, uh, there was some new society that was reviewing mob movies and the history of mob movies. And Goodfellas was deemed as the biggest mob movie of all time, which was kind of cool. Well, bigger than The Godfather. Bigger than The Godfather. I was not aware of that. I yep. wouldn't have bet on that either. But and uh, unfortunately, Ray was <laughs> briefly you know, aware of that and shortly passed away at the beginning of the summertime. I've never, uh, to this date, heard what happened or autopsy or anything, but uh, yeah. well, apparently they found him in his hotel room midnight, middle of the night, uh, shooting a movie, I think, in the Dominican Republic. And uh, he was sadly gone. Yeah. Well, in the photograph, I mean, you're up behind the bar, and yeah. you've got uh, uh, Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci yep. and uh, Ray Liotta. Yep. There was an, I think there was another character in there as well. Um, there was, well, let's see, Pesci. There was uh, Frank Vincent, but he was not in that shot. It was on the other side of it. I he see. was, he was the, actually the, the reason why that whole shot said, because he decided to use an expletive that we, we won't use at the moment. <laughs> go, go back and get your shine box. And Pesci went ballistic and he said, keep him here, keep him here, we're coming back. And that's when all the commotion started, was when he returned and decided to, you know, do his work with Frank Vincent. Yeah, well, that's, so. uh, <laughs> uh, we have an opportunity to discuss uh, this type of stuff. Like I say, Glenn and I go back to Harbor School. Oh my, yes. And uh, through, through Buckley at Junior High. Yep. And uh, I don't know if it was your decision or your parents, but uh, you uh, meandered off to Cheshire Academy for, uh, for your high school years. I did, four years. Um, it, well, you know, it was a funny time. Um, the country was in flux. I don't think that my folks were really thrilled with the education that I was getting. Um, they were concerned about the war, and I think um, because they could afford it, they decided they were going to and put me somewhere where they thought I was going to be a little bit more isolated from the outside world, which strangely turned out to be just the opposite. You know, <laughs> I mean, being on a, on a, on a boarding school campus and a, and a campus like that is, uh, is, is just a small version of a college campus is really what it is. And you know what happens with college campuses when you, when you have a cause and you have a reason and you have motivational drive to, to feed that whole concept. And especially, we were in the throes of the Vietnam War, you know, in 1968. Uh, everybody was protesting. Uh, the New Haven Green, uh, the Black Panthers were all over the place. It was, it was, it was just a, a, a big mess, and so um, it. Um, they thought I was going to be safer there, but it, you know, I ended up with a different type of education. Um, the kids that I ended up uh, really knowing 
um, were fellows, a lot of them for other countries. Oh. Uh, different other walks of life that, that I would never even consider, ever heard of. Uh, fellows were, one gen uh, fellow's uh, father was the general manager of uh, Sears and Roebuck for all of Brazil. You know, different, but, s but these big monster corporate, you know, entities and stuff. And um, being around them was, it was interesting. It, it just gave me a different flair and a different taste for what's going on around the world. So by the time I got to college, I had a whole different perspective on. Yeah. You know, the whole and, and when you went to college, uh, you you ventured off to uh, American International College, yeah, AIC, yep. uh, which is uh, about an hour, hour and a quarter away in Springfield. Yep. And uh, why did you pick AIC? I mean, I, I mean, you're the only person. Actually, you're not the only person. Jim Calhoun, I think, went to AIC. Yeah, and also Harry Finolis, if you remember, if you know Harry. I do. Yeah, he's a classmate of mine. Yep. Harry. Oh, he's a year ahead of me. Excuse me. Yep. Harry is, Harry was there. Um, it turned out, truth be told, that my father's uncle, uh, my grandmother's brother, got his pharmacy degree at AIC. And he turned out, when he found out that I was considering it, he thought it was just terrific. He thought that that was just the best thing. Now, I had been considering business schools um, up until that point, but I don't know. It seemed like I was going to be leaning more toward a liberal arts program than business. I figured if I got a bus you know, business, I'll go into the family business, and that's business. You know, that's, that was my thought at the time because I didn't really have any desire to apply anything business-wise to whatever else I was considering doing. Um, and so when the liberal arts thing opened up and the AIC, pro I, I got this you know, invitation and an acceptance letter from AIC. I said, well, you know something, I think I'm going to take, take a shot at this. It was the only school that I had applied to uh, for liberal arts strictly with nothing to do with business. Did you apply to other schools? Yeah, and, and got accepted. You know, uh, ex uh, Bentley, I got accepted. And that's a business um, school. Yep. Um, where else? This is going back a couple of days. Um, anyway, uh, we ended up in a, in, a, in a liberal arts program anyway. And um, I remember within my first week, I had taken a walk and decided to go take a peek at the radio station. And uh, I took one step into the hallway, and I took one look into the broadcast, the, the, you know, the broadcast operation in their main studio. And I just kind of took a look around, and I kind of went, I think I'm home. <laughs> so, I mean, you know? was that, that, that literally, I was, was going to, you know, It was ask, that, it was that profound. What, 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 what was that thing that, that got that itch going to get you into uh, the communications uh, of this type? Being that close to live radio. It, we, we, you, were not, you weren't close to it, you were in it. You know, it was the first opportunity that I literally had to really just step into it, just myself, with no obstruction and nobody directing me and nobody moving around. And I said to myself, you know, this, this is an interesting way to get a message out. But, it, it, but the, the process of getting the message out was, the, was what tickled me. That, that's what it, uh, that's... So what type of radio were you doing uh, as a college student? I mean, were you a DJ? Or? No, actually I was doing more news and public affairs. And at first I was only doing engineering. The, the, the voice stuff was, was le believe it or not, later on. I had originally gone in there because I wanted to be a broadcast, you know, a broadcast technician. Uh, my responsibilities were, uh, we were a, an ABC radio affiliate, so the network radio feeds used to come in from New York by way of the phone lines. It was my job to make sure that those phone lines were ready and hot all day long and as long as I was on, you know, on duty. And to make sure that those feeds were ready to go in the event of an, any kind of emergency, those lines would have to be activated and the national news would come over the air and we would, you know, fade our programming down, bring theirs up, but those feeds always had to be ready to go. And that was my first responsibility as a, radio, you know, as a broadcast engineer, so. Well, that, that's behind the scenes. It's kind of like we've got two gentlemen who are in the control room here. Who I've met, yes. And who, who do a great job putting, they they certainly putting this show on. I see that. And I appreciate their good work. So we had a little chat. It's, uh, I, I'm, I, I very much uh, like the, 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 the quality of what you guys got here. This, those guys are sharp. Well, they, they, they do well. And uh, yeah. you know, I, I also want to just give a tip of the hat to a mutual friend of ours uh, who's in your industry, and that's uh, Harry Thomas. Oh, yes. yes. Who has been kind enough over many years to uh, make recommendations uh, for uh, individuals for, for programming, and, and everyone he's recommended has been, uh, it's been a good show. And he kind of egged me on to bring you on, I might add, I and mean, I think you know that. Well, he, he told me he was considering doing it, and I said, you know something, for Marty? Sure, I'd go to front of the set for Marty, absolutely. 
I'm surprised that he didn't want to come on with us and join us. Well, when we get through, we can both give him a little bit of a dig and see if we can I, I, get him may, back on. May, well, now that, that, get him on, not now, back Well, now that we've started on. this and we've already passed the level of fire, you know, it shouldn't be such a big deal. <laughs> we should be able to get him on here without too much muss or fuss. Or bring him on with his sister. Yeah. Well, she's now living up in uh, Lowell, uh, Massachusetts. And, yep. uh, but she's a local girl. She was in my brother's class at, uh, at New London High School. Okay. I met, I met her on a movie set um, uh, a few years back, never knowing that, that she and Harry were related. And so uh, I remember getting off the set and we're just talking and she says, uh, uh, she goes, oh, there's Harry. I said, oh, you know Harry? And she says, yeah. She says, oh. I says, he's my brother. And I went, <laughs> don't I feel like the... Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Well, so. she, it's funny. I mean, she had reached out to me a number of years ago uh, via Facebook uh, inquiring as to whether or not I was related to, uh, whether I was or was related to Eric Olson, who's my brother. I remember. Uh, Eric has uh, been deceased a long time. I know. I remember when it happened. Uh, but uh, that kindled a conversation that's been ongoing ever since. And uh, I liked Eric. He's a good man. And a uh, matter of fact, uh, I, I had I met her very recently uh, with her husband uh, at a party that the I guess it was the local Screen Actors Guild was having in Rhode Island. You were yeah, at that yeah, party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you. Well, I saw you there. That was that's that was a surprise. <laughs> I said, no, it was a boy, surprise for me too. Is it, boy, Marty's got some serious reach. I didn't know he was tied into Providence. Now <laughs> you know, I was like, look at this. So, so that was uh, that was a fun night out, and that was the first time I had a chance to uh, cross paths with her face to face. And uh, Harry, I would see in, uh, at the Connecticut Sun Games. He had seats courtside. Matter of fact, I think Gilda and her husband both had, had uh, seats at Sun Games. I remember seeing them for years and years and years. Uh, and then they mo left the area and they got rid of their, their seats. But uh, I had, there was no connection at that time. It just, it was just, you see somebody walking in front before and after every game and just, you know, you just, and, and it would be Harry. Yeah. <laughs> it's, he he's he's right, on, right on the court side. He's, yeah. he's right he on there. He has a presence about him. I mean, he, when he comes by, you kind of know that he's in the room. We'll have, we'll have to get that presence in front of this camera. Well, got something to work on. Harry and I have uh, done some very interesting work in the last couple of years. Um, oh, maybe three or four years ago, we had uh, bumped into each other on the set of uh, Castle Rock, the Stephen uh, King series. And we're sitting down talking and catching up and talking about old acting jobs and where we were and who did what and who we worked with. And, you know, at one point we just, we sort of, the, the conversation sort of migrated over to, well, you know, maybe we should do something interesting here. Maybe we should collaborate on a piece. Maybe we should do something together. And then all of a sudden COVID popped in. And then the first big issue besides people have, trying to figure out what to do with COVID was Black Lives Matter. And I get a phone call from Harry, and he says, I have an idea for a script. I said, really? Why don't you send, send it over? What, what, let, let's see what you got here. So he has an outline, and that's kind of how we do it. He'll come up with a particular idea that he's got to, uh, uh, that he wants to make a point about. And um, he'll, he'll come up with a bit of a rough, and then he'll send it over. He says, what do you think of this? And I said, hmm, okay, well, let's put it on the editor, and let's, see, let's, let's sort of see if we can sort of form it like a, like a piece of, like a statue, like a... Like a, like, a, you know, like a piece of art. And so we'll change a sentence or two, and by the time we got done, we had a very cohesive um, Black Lives PSA where we, our tagline was, Black Lives Matter and will continue to matter today, tomorrow, and every day after that. Mm -hmm. And it just, when you get that last line, boom, you know, you just want to make sure you, you, know, you get the message. And that was our first, and we've done probably We've done it on the military, we've done on, um, on, on uh, wear a mask, uh, you know, all kinds of health things. And I think we probably have to date probably 130 of them now in the can. Uh, these are all PSAs? Yes, all PSAs. So there's a multitude of ways to, to, uh, to make a living in this industry. It's, just, it's, it's not necessarily that everybody's going to be Robert De Niro. No, no. Or Joe Pesci or Meryl Streep or whatever. But... Uh, whether you're doing PSAs or engineering, keeping the line open, lighting. I never, I never, you know, one thing I, I always tried to do was surround myself with people that know more than I do. Just seemed like a more smarter pro, you know, smarter play than, than, than not, you know. 
I think that's uh, that's a smart thing to do because well, they'll it, make you look good. Well, not only it's not so much that it's it's more like an attitude. The attitude will sort of carry you. You know, it'll it'll um, it, it'll take you through the pretty much anything you know that, that you end up doing. And this way, you, 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 by accident, you'll learn more. You know, so it's just a it's an attitude. It's a concept, and it's uh, it's a way to carry on. Now it's interesting because you know, Harry lives locally, and uh, you do too. Now you also—I don't know if you still do—but there was a period where you spent time in New York. Thirty years, actually. Um, but you're able to operate in this field. So far, here it's, in southeastern Connecticut, well, it's, it's not as if you have to be in New York or have to be in Los Angeles. I'm—I'm um, I'm not that—I'm not established well enough yet where I can still get away with. Um, um, branching out or just staying in one spot. In other words, I'm, I'm still, I'm probably going to have to go to LA in the next month or two because I, I want to res- uh, record a new studio demo for, my, for the voiceover stuff. Um, and I have a, a particular guy in mind in a particular studio that I want to use. And it happens to be in California. And I think it's going to be more important. You know, a lot of people saying, well, you can do a Zoom call or something like that. I said, no, nah, not for this. This yeah. my point is, you can have your home base here. It's not as if oh, you, yeah. you, oh, well, that, well, you, that you feel that you have well, to be in in the eye of the storm, so to speak, every day. Well, most of the stuff that Harry and I have done um, has been done, you know, just late at night, in the in the middle of the night, you know, coming up with just a couple of ideas. We'll throw something back and forth. We've got it down now, so any particular idea that we want to develop into a piece of copy or into a video, with you know, properly narrated, properly punctuated, properly. Uh, edited and, and ready for air, really. Everything that we put out is ready for air in any medium. You know, social, social media, uh, regular broadcast, it doesn't matter. It's, it'll, it'll all come in on MP3 format and boom, right on the air. Um, and that's the beauty of it. So every single piece like that is, uh, is set up that way. Um, but that's, that's really how the process goes is, you know, we'll come up with this idea and we can usually knock a, knock a whole concept out in about, about an hour and a half. <laughs> it's, it's really, uh, we've gotten really good at it, needless to say. Well, I mean, you've been doing this a long time. And at what, what point did you kind of transition from the phone lines to the studio? Were you that in college? Um, and when did you get out of radio and into other, other things, such as modeling, doing voiceovers, uh, acting? Uh, well, on the screen, I don't know if you've done much television or not, or, or um, I've done I, I've done a, bit, a couple of you know I did a, I worked on a few series you know TV series I was I did the first three episodes of Law and Order I worked on the pilot of Law and Order um, I'm currently I'm working on Julia the Julia Child's uh, story that's uh, in season two shooting in Boston I worked on another Sony picture that I can't really talk about yet because they're still in production uh, but been put a, put a few weeks in different you know parts of the summer. Um, Works on um, Salem's Lot. Uh, let's see. Um, what else? Hocus Pocus Two. That's that should be out with Bette Luther, their second piece. Um, a bunch of them actually. So it's. Uh, I, I'm still migrating. I'm still moving. It started in in in, in the technical side of radio, and then turned into talent because of just a, a, a quirky thing. And that really was a quirky thing. While I was in my first semester, uh, I remember there was one week we were having some trouble with one of the one of the pieces of equipment in the uh, in the production studio. So while I was taking my readings one day, I get this tap 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 on the window, and it's my general manager motioned to me to come in. Like I said, okay, what what, what did I do now? <laughs> you know, <laughs> or what didn't I do now that's causing a problem? Well, it turns out that. There's a relay in, in, inside of one of these control consoles that basically, when you flip the microphone switch, it turns the speakers off um, and turns the light on on the outside so to make sure nobody's making any noise. And that switch wasn't working. So you'd throw the key, the microphone would still be open, but the, lights, the light didn't go on and the speakers didn't mute. So you were having a sort of a semi-feedback thing going on. Well, so we were, while we were having the discussion, there was, there was a tape rolling that I really wasn't aware of. It was up on, up on a higher shelf, a big telex machine. The reels were going, but I thought they were picking up a network feed. I really wasn't paying much attention to it. And so I went back into the main broadcast studio to finish up my, my log readings for the top of the hour. And then I got another tap, tap, tap on the window again. I was like, oh, things are really getting hot today. All right, what else? And so I get in there, and he says, uh, I want you to listen to something. So all of a sudden, he's got a remote console built into the, into the, into the deck on his, in front of him. 
So he hits the rewind, and I see this machine start to spin back. I was like, well, we got a problem with the machine now? Now I got to pull apart a Telex machine? This is great. <laughs> you know, my first, first couple of weeks. Um, and so he hits the play button, and I hear a background, and I hear a, a noise that could be, could be a noise here, it could be in any really, in any broadcast studio. And there were people talking. I recognized his voice. I recognized the other, the other guy that was in the studio at the time. But there was this other voice that was talking. And it, you know, I wasn't really paying much attention to it. Well, the truth be told, I never um, heard myself on a professional series machine before. And the guy that was doing all that, that talking turned out to be me. Oh. And at that point, um, they made it clear that, that if, I if I'd like to, I could you know, start doing stuff in front of a microphone, you know, public service announcement, station IDs, that sort of thing. And so that's kind of where that whole thing started. And it kept going. And so that was first week in September, 1972, 50 years. That's uh, good stuff. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I, was there a, a tug from your family to go in, get into the Linder Dodge and the car business, or were they uh, your, your folks? <coughs> and I, I happen to like the car business. Uh, my brother loved the car business when he was in it, my brother Peter, um, and, and really brought it to the success level that it was at one point, but there were some family dynamics that were going on. And um, when I came in at my, you know, just after college, I, la I was there for about four years, and uh, there was too much going on. I just I couldn't I couldn't deal with that anymore. So I had to I had to get out, and that's when I moved to New York, and that was October of 1980. So so uh, you basically you've, you did what you had to do, is what it boils down to. Sadly, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, because as, as I recall, as, as, as a young, young fella, that, I mean, you were a guy who always had a, a, your pulse on cars and you, were, you, you could say was a car guy. I'm not. I was more of a sports guy. But, uh, oh, yeah. Well, it's, still it's, am too. it was still, you know, it was more occupational. I, I, I knew cars. Um, the, mechanic side of, uh, the mechanical side of the cars made sense to me. And then um, as time went on, um, I, I got involved with the advertising you know, for the car side of the stuff. And because uh, our, our presence on the air in the public eye was starting to get a little stiff um, to a point where I, I really wasn't happy with, with the way the family name was going. And if I could do anything about it, uh, I would like to try. And at that point, um, I sort of took over the advertising, at least the you know, radio, TV advertising, media stuff, not just newspaper, excuse me. My uncle seemed to like to still hang on to it, which was fine. He could, you know, do all the stuff he wanted as far as the ad buys and stuff. But when it came to the radio um, and TV, uh, that was a medium that they obviously didn't understand, and I did. And so I said, look, uh, if you guys are going to spend the money and you're going to do this, you're going to do it right. You know, we're not going to look like a bunch of idiots standing in front of a camera making fools of ourselves. We're going to send out a message. We're going to let them know who we are. We're going to let them know that, that we're honest guys. And we're going to let them know that we do things right. Period. Should be easy. And so that's what we did for 25 years, mm -hmm. the last 25 years of the business. Because I just, I, just, I just couldn't allow it to go I'm any other way. I'm trying to think now. Were you, were you the voice of Linder Dodge? I was. I was for 25 years, yeah. Well, that's part of the family biz. Yeah, part of the family history. You know. But they... It wasn't, it was partially my voice, but there was also what that whole thing represented. And if the, the, the real truth of the matter is, is that there were still hundreds of cars running around this country that still say Linder on the back of them from all of our Navy customers who have, or people who have just moved out of the area. I've seen them in every state that I've ever been in. Yeah. And now, I just. Now, you, now, 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 your dad and your uncle, uh, did they, they start that business or had been started a generation My grandmother before? and my grandfather started that in 1946. And their first place was down on Washington Street where um, United Electric used to be. Remember that? Remember? Yep. United yep. Electric, right across the street from the, from the tail end of the bank, the back door of Commerce Bank. And they were there for a few years. And I think then in the early 50s, I think maybe 51, 52, they bought the 409 Broad Street building made half of it a dealership and the other half they rented out to a transmission company. And then when they started to 
you know, find their way along. They didn't have, need the revenue from the transmission company and they just needed the space. So they doubled the size of the showroom, doubled the size of the building, and doubled the parking, and uh, off they went. Yeah. Well, one, one gentleman who was a fixture with that business beyond the lenders was uh, Spencer Lancaster. Oh my God, yes. Spencer was, was as close to family as it gets. He was, uh, he's certainly an icon in this town. Um, Still is. I, I mean, I don't know how, how high a status you can go. I think he's, <laughs> I think he's, he's at the top of that ladder. Um, love Spencer, uh, his whole crew. I, they're like family. In fact, <laughs> I think it might have been Spencer Jr. who made sure that I, I was safe when I was in school, <laughs> you know, when I was going to Buckley. <laughs> How things are. Uh, now you've done, well, I'm going to just take a half a break here. Folks, you're watching City Focus. And I'm Marty Olson, your host. And so I feel really honored to have such a uh, quality guest, a gentleman who I've known forever, and uh, I'm finding this conversation and, and Glenn's commentary most interesting, and if you'd like to contribute to the program, uh, please do. Uh, we do accept phone calls, and the number just going up on the screen here at 860-440-3154. So whether you've got questions for Glenn, commentary, perhaps you know him and you'd like to share a story uh, of your interaction. And, uh, and, and Glenn, I know, uh, has got uh, contact with many of our folks that we grew up with. Uh, you still may have a, a, a uh, your Rolodex is, is still warm. Well, uh, <laughs> in that, that, regard. That, that Rolodex, unfortunately, this last year and a half with COVID and everything has gotten about six notches slimmer. I lost well, you know, some, COVID's some, slowed very, down a lot some of very things, close but. friends had passed. Uh, my dear cousin and friend Michael Friedman passed this past year. Our friend Chip Gora passed yep. this, this past 18 months. Is it, is it up, coming out two years now? Um, my best friend from college, uh, a fellow by the name of Robert Sims, who, whose family used to own the Sims uh, clothing company. Uh, we're an educated consumer, is our best customer, remember that? Yep. Robbie passed this also this past year, um, and a couple of other folks. So it's, uh, it's been tough that way, you know, losing, losing people that are that close in, in that short a time, you know. Yeah. But I know that uh, at least with, with, with my class at New London, um, we've had a group of women who have done a good job each, uh, every five years putting out a uh, class reunion. Periodically oh, yeah. you've dropped I, in oh, on yeah. those. Yeah, no, I've been invited, uh, you know, whenever they, they have something going on, I usually get an invite. So I still know a lot. Of, I still know know and recognize a lot of the folks that. That's uh, my point. That, oh know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you're still welcome back here amongst the the local the locals here, as you have elevated yourself in the professional uh, airwaves, and you've done work for me in in my in my political career, uh, yes, radio uh, that has been on a number of stations. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I get on uh, Lee Elsie's program periodically. He has me on every month or uh, five or six weeks or so. We we'll discuss go. local topics primarily and uh, whether I'm in or out of office. And he's been, uh, apparently he still values my thoughts and opinions. <laughs> well, I don't uh, know. When it comes to politics, I, you know, I always go to you. When it comes to the local stuff, I have, that, that you, you, you are, got your, you've always had your finger on the pulse of this place, always. From 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 a for a long time now. Yeah, but uh, you have you know the, the our radio ads that we did and you were you were my voice were uh, top quality and uh, they stood out. Well, that was that was besides me. We had besides and you that was our, our third member on that crew was was our dearly uh, departed Chip. Yeah, well, in terms of writing and his not his also his deep knowledge of uh, politics. Yep. Trying to come up with a message that we could uh, yeah, no, get the most bang for the buck, as they say, in a very you know, brief period of time. I mean, you don't have uh, 30 minutes, you have 30 seconds. Got to get the message out. Gotta now, you brought some stuff here that... Let, uh, me see, let me see if we can resurrect that. Um, this, might, this is the first, this is one of the ones you and I did together. Let's see if we can make it play. I'm Marty Olson, and I approve this message. At first glance, you might ask why Marty Olson would want to be a New London City Councilor again. He's a successful retired business owner, a former New London mayor, a former adjunct college professor, and has an MBA. But if you know Marty, you'd also know that he's a guy who has been obsessed with bringing good government to New London for over 25 years. 
If you know Marty, then you know he has tirelessly devoted himself to worthwhile projects, like reading is fundamental, and the New England District of Kiwanis. But Marty's real reason for running for New London City Council is because he loves New London deeply, and he knows that he can make a positive difference in the quality of life for the people of New London. Send him back. Vote for Marty Olson for New London City Council on Tuesday, November 5th. Paid for by Olson for Council, Laurie Jacobowski, Treasurer. Well, here's the real deal. That was a, a real live advertisement. Yeah, that was a, that was a, that was that really hit. That hit, but that was you. You know, we couldn't have done that. We couldn't have put that thing together if if you didn't do all that stuff. I mean, you 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 hadn't gone through all that. So, uh, testimony is off to you there, kiddo. You know. I can make the magic, but you got to have the history there in order to make the magic. Perhaps you should have done radio a little bit this last election a year ago. I didn't do radio, and uh, maybe uh, that could have been the missing link because I came up short. You never know, <laughs> and especially now with your access to social media. Oh boy! Hey, if you're still around, you know, in the next the next tier, we get, it's not like we don't have a lot going on. You know, this is, the government has not been boring. It's been a lot of things, but not boring. Well, that's that, that's a fact. That's a fact. Um, is there any any anything else that you brought in, or is it that that was the end? Well, that right? was that was just that one piece. I just wanted when when I was talking to your your, your engineering gents in the in the control room, I just wanted to make sure that this could at least. Um, I don't know if you brought anything else in, or if that was. Yet. Um, if I can find where the, uh, I may not be able to see that. Um, well, here's a. <laughs> Here's a funny spot that, that I wrote for Father's Day. It was, <laughs> I was in a funny mood once, and well, let's see if we can maybe make that plan. The 12 worst Father's Day gifts. Number one, nothing. Not terribly original, but definitely popular. Number two, a five course dinner featuring your most hated food. Number three, a 14 karat gold cigar cutter with a dull blade. Number four, a new windproof lighter that refuses to light when it's windy. Number five, a solar charged flashlight that won't work in the dark. Number six, a new set of suspenders that won't hold up your pants. Number seven, a new shirt that is too tight at the neck right out of the package. Number eight, a new brand of cologne that repels rather than attracts. Number nine, a cell phone whose numbers are too small to read. Number 10, a brand new pair of pants that are too tight at the waist after the tailor. Number 11, a brand new hat that sadly covers your eyes as well as your ears. Number 12, a universal remote control that refuses to control anything, including your TV. So, in the end, it's the thought that counts. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> oh boy! Now, did you write that as well? I did. <laughs> I had thought about all the times that I had gotten my father something that I thought would be the really, really nifty, some, something that that nobody else had had at the time, something so odd and so different and so unusual. He'd, he'd say, you know, well, that's that's pre that's uh, that's pretty interesting, you know. <laughs> it just never happened. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, something in the spirit of that in the spirit of the effort that sometimes goes into it, why don't we just mention, you know, something that just never seems to work. Yeah. And I came up with, I don't know why it was 12, it could have been 10, it could have been 15, it, you know, I don't know if I was doing commandments or months or lunar or where my brain was at the time, but when I came out, Harry just laughed, he was just, he was, he was just busy just snickering from it, you know, just because it was so glib and so, you know, so negative as far as Father's Day was Good. concerned. Wow. So. I thought they were pretty funny. Uh, you know, in preparation for the program, Glenn has sent me over uh, some material, and uh, you had done a, uh, a piece regarding Lighthouse Inn. Yeah, I did, actually. No. And uh, I don't know if you have the audio on that, but uh, that was, I thought, very good, and it was certainly did it. Um, you outlined the issues and where they are, where they're going, and uh, I thought it was exceptionally positive. I, I love, I love the lighthouse. Then, um, you know, my family has had, you know, all kinds of affairs. Let me see if I can maybe uh, find and track this thing down. Uh, 
But that was, I thought, fabulous. I mean, you ha also had a video with that as well, that you were doing the voice. But uh, it was really, see if I, can bring this I up. thought, special. This is what happens when you put somebody on the spot here on live TV. Well, that's okay. We can see if we can make, make, make this thing come up. Give me a second. But as you know, with uh, Chip Gora, who was, uh, again, goes back to childhood, uh, he was a, a terrific uh, advocate and. Uh, mentor and advisor for uh, many of my political campaigns. Hmm, maybe. Again, folks, while Glenn's searching, I just want to remind you that we are live, and if you'd like to uh, contribute to the program, please do. Call us at 860-440-3154. Uh, to uh, offer your thoughts and opinions on uh, our conversation tonight. And as you can tell, it's kind of a free-form deal here, so uh, it need not be directly related to what we're chatting about, but uh, pipe in anyway. Let us know what's on your mind. Sorry, Marty. Looks like this is... I, I've got a new phone, and sometimes it, uh, it wants to cooperate, and sometimes it just doesn't leave us in promo. Well, that's okay. Let's see if we can get that operating. Well, I know that, you know, when we did the radio ads for my council, you, and we did that for two separate uh, elections, if yep, I'm not we mistaken. Did. Yep, we did. Um, that through, through connections that you had, we were able to access uh, professional studios, and that also was a major assistance in terms of the quality of uh, the product. Well, it was, it was sort of necessary because it, if we wanted to do it, we had to do it right. Uh, there was no way that it could go any other way, and, and I kind of get that way when I sort of, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, you, you get to a point where, um, Oh, this might be it. Hang on. West Guthrie Place in oh, New London, here Connecticut. We go, here we go. Original. Here we, here we go. The elegance and grandeur of Southern New England has finally returned. The Lighthouse Inn, formerly the old Guthrie Mansion, at 6 West Guthrie Place in New London, Connecticut, originally built in 1906 as a private residence, has fallen on hard times, having been closed for the last 15 years. Four years ago, the property was purchased by Glastonbury developer Alvin Christie who has taken on the monumental task to restore the inn to its original decor and stature. Recently, and just as the majority of the restoration was reaching final completion, the upper level accidentally caught fire from a drill, igniting the interior of an outside wall, causing interior smoke and roof damage. As the repairs and restorations are currently underway, the bar restaurant, now known as the 1902 Tavern, is now open Wednesday through Monday, 4 to 9, for your drinking and dining pleasure. Closed Tuesdays. And so the renaissance continues at the newly renovated Lighthouse Inn, 6 West Guthrie Place, overlooking Long Island Sound in scenic New London, Connecticut. All right, that's terrific. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, and, and for an iconic uh, place in New London, Yep. That has had its ups and downs over time. Ironically, I mean, it's, fire seems to have been uh, you know, a big issue. They've had two or three fires in that place over the course of many, many years. <clears throat> well, this one uh, was, was, I don't think they even saw this one coming. That I actually talked to the fire marshal because uh, I have a few connections in that neighborhood and um, found out that it ha had to do with a hammer drill striking an interior uh, stone on the inside of the wall in order to anchor the, the, the big sign that they were going to hang out there. And apparently that was just enough to start some, some uh, the, the fill between the two walls and whoom, off it went. So, Well, they've overcome that. The 
facility is open, and uh, I know I know the uh, the bar and the restaurant are. I don't know how the rooms are going. I haven't been I don't down think there in the a while. rooms are even remotely ready for. But but the uh, but they're active. They, they're certainly active, and they're making. They're open. I think, they're on, I think on the weekends, yep. and they are uh, will be open for Thanksgiving. So oh, that's going to be a home run. That will be terrific if they can get that going. So that that should be, uh, I think. Terrific for for them and the community. Well, you know, this thing was also sort sort of kind of a kind of labor of love too. You know, I remember you know <laughs> those guys from <laughs> when I was a child. I mean, we've had parties and 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 funerals and weddings and holiday celebrations. Uh, you know, for years and years and years. And um, Donald was always at the at the helm there, greeting us. You know, seating us down. I mean, it was uh, it was like home. They'd see us come in. It's like a, another part of the family, you know. The, and their their food was always terrific. Uh, you know, you you remember? Absolutely. You know, well, just my the Kiwanis club met there for years, and we, oh God, we, yeah. we got out just before the that recent close. I would say recent. It's been that it was years ago, but when it closed, they kind of had some problems, and we got out just uh, in the nick of time, so to speak. But, I remember uh, my aunt getting married um, in that in the big room in the back with that long corridor. Yep. Back in the, I think the late fifties, early sixties, you know, we we actually had a, a, a wedding, a full blown wedding there. It was, it was great. Love that place. Glad to see it's back up and running. Well, I I concur. Now, if some a youngster, I say a good youngster can be a high school student or a college kid, uh, maybe a recent college grad, was to sidle up and want to tap into your experience and say, well. Mr. Mr. Linder, what do I have to do to to break into into this business? I mean, as we noted earlier, I mean it's it's vast. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, there's writers, uh, it, there's, know, there's it, lighting, there's I, voice. I, I learn every I learn something new every day. I never stop learning, especially about the way this business goes. There was a time when my type of business, my my, my type of voice, my my delivery. Um, was not as popular as some of the lighter, uh, younger sounds. Um, but I think all of a sudden there's a certain reality and a certain, I don't know, um, a certain demand, a, a call for attention. Uh, in other words, people are looking to be addressed again. They just don't want to hear just noise. It becomes white noise to them. You met a product. And if, if, if the, the words on that card say, don't, um, create a, a, a picture in your head, then you failed. Then the thing's not going to sell a cork. No disrespect to corks. Uh, you know, it, it, and you have to learn, I think part of the, the, the fundamental part of it is, is that you have to learn how to be able to look at something on a, on, a, on a piece of paper and then figure out a way to make it sound more than it is. Take the words and, and create something from them is, is basically the only way I can, I can explain it. You look, you look at these words, say, on a, on a piece of paper, a script, and you have to come up with a, a my, my instructor used to call it a point of view. And once you get that point of view, then you read that copy it, with that point of view. So in a lot of cases, it's just not standing up in front of a device and talking, because anybody can read. Well, no, I take that back. Most people can read, um, standing in front of a microphone and just read. However, if you don't put some life to it, that's what it's going to sound like. It's going to sound like somebody read something. That's all it was. And, 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 and your idea will never come to fruition. However, once you put your life into it, you put your emotion into it, you put your, uh, you, you give it a, like my instructor used to say, give it a point of view, give it an attitude. I mean, it's not, it's not easy. I mean, in, in this vein, I, no, re it's, it's, I, re I remember as a, as a, as a youth, um, listening to Ralph Hauk, who was the manager of the New York Yankees, doing advertisements for Suppose Socks. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Ralph Hauk, and I wear Suppose Socks. I mean, you talk about reading. I mean, this is stilted. Uh, but he's the manager of the New York Yankees. So yeah, that, nobody's going to nobody's take it away from him. But I'm sure he's, he's, he's like, but people like that become personalities of their own. And their trademark becomes this, this limp, you know, lifeless reed that, that just uh, everybody kind of scratches their head going, this, this, this is not going to work. 
But every once in a while, something like that will happen, like Tom Carvel, for example. Yeah, well, you just took the words out of my mouth. You know, I mean, here's a guy who... who uh, who's rough as it comes, but brilliant. But absolutely brilliant. And he made great ice cream, too. Yeah, and, and uh, Dave Thomas with Wendy's. Dave Thomas, yep. Just guys like that who, who's just, they put themselves right in there. Carlin Sanders, yeah. you know, stuff himself right in there, you know. Um, they got a lot of stuff on the History Channel now that, the, that is, yeah, you know, the they're, they're highlighting. Be, oh, I'm loving that. Oh, I mean, just, absolutely. Just just, stuff. Oh, yeah, and we lived through it. We lived through a lot of that stuff, you and I. You know, that's... Uh, this is, this is kind of a, a very <laughs> a, an interesting thing going on here, just because um, I don't know if anybody knew, but uh, Marty was probably the tallest uh, kindergartner I'd ever saw. I, I, I'd never seen a, a, a guy that was this big in kindergarten, and he was my age. The problem is, it just for him was that just he never grew any taller, and we all just sort of grew up. We all grew up. Through, through, through... Uh, what, you were through six foot... Through junior high school, I was... And I got to be about as tall as I am now by the time I was 12. Yep, yep. Which is, uh, so I was a bit bigger than most of the kids. And yeah. everybody's caught up and shot by, but I'm still the big guy. But, yeah, but see, nobody would ever know that. Nobody would ever know that there was that time, that duration, because everything's evened out. But that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be the tall guy. It's good to be the big guy. No, so it was... Uh, it was fun. We, we grew up in a, in, a, in, a, in a good time. I don't know if I'd want to grow up in times today. But we, well, we our, had, our time. We had, some, we had some tough times, though. Yes, we did. We had, and and there was, those, were, those were unfortunately nationally known tough times, like when the Thresher, we lost the Thresher back in 63, or when we lost Jack Kennedy. Yeah, well, the uh, Thresher, uh, the Harvey was the commanding officer. That's right. And, and, uh, he Bruce had Harvey's a, father, uh, that's right. And Lee Craig's uh, father was on board that boat, too. You know, uh, the Lieutenant Harvey boys were on my Little League team. Yep, yep. We went to school. He was in our third grade class. So that was, uh, yeah, that was a bit startling. You know, but uh, we've lived through some, uh, some pretty interesting times. It's just, it's just uh, ironic. Here we are, years later, uh, in, in a different medium, still hanging out and still carrying on. You know, that's good stuff. Yeah. That, that's, that's good stuff. Yeah. I just want to take a half a step back because we were discussing earlier sure. your, your uh, interest in cars because one thing that I uh, often will run into you is uh, in the summer the, months the car down shows. at Ocean oh, Beach yeah. uh, at the, uh, poke my head the in. cruise nights that you, we, we will both uh, often make an appearance at. I enjoy going down. I'm not as much of the car guy as you are, but I enjoy schmoozing and seeing a lot oh, of yeah. folks. And, uh, oh, yeah. Well, it's always interesting to see what shows up. Every year we have a, a, new, a new grouping that, that came from somewhere. They kind of like the area and they like the drive down here. So, um, But I enjoy the car shows. Uh, you know, it, it's funny. Of all the people in my family, I was probably the most under the car inclined. I understood the mechanics probably more than anybody. You know, and I could get into there and, you know, and with the best of them and, you know, go to town. One of the few reasons why when I used to walk in the shop most of the time, Anybody from management, nobody, you know, mechanics don't want anybody around. You know, they just want to be left, left alone. I'd walk in and say, hey, what you working on? Oh, he said, by the way, you got an extra set? You, you got a minute? I said, yeah, what do you need? He said, well, I, you got to, I want to take that crowbar and push that transmission forward so I can reline it back on the bell housing. Oh, yeah, sure, give me a minute. So I, you know, take off my coat and I throw on a shop coat and a pair of gloves. And I get under there and, you know, try to, you know, help him with it, realign the transmission. Not unusual. You know, I did, I did it my second nature. And it got to the point where, you know, my father said, oh, don't go in there and bother them. Dad, I'm not bothering them. <laughs> you know, just they need a hand, so I, I know what they're doing and I can help them. So what, what, what's, what's the rub? You know? yeah, that's all right. But I understood it, and it, 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 it's, it, I've profited from that, you know, from that, you know, knowing that over the years. You know, just a little extra, little extra, little item to the, to the basket, you know. Yeah. Well, what are, you, what are you and Harry working on? Harry's published a couple of books now. Yeah, I don't has. know if that's, that's, have you been involved with any, either of those? What I've been involved with, with help, is helping him do the promos for those books. I voice them. Um, I help him write them sometimes, depending on the venues. That's what I've been doing. I, mean, I think his first book was a lot of photography. Well, both of them are, uh, actually. What he's done is he has um, a bunch of pictures that he's taken in various you know, venues around the country and around wherever he's traveled. And then he's compiled them in this book, and then he has little sayings that he has put after him. And of course, you know, he gives himself the photo credit. And um, 
and, and these, I think there's a couple hundred of them in each book. This, the first book was, was just uh, uh, photos and these little sayings, and the second book, I believe, is now uh, bigger print, so people with, with uh, vision issues uh, you know, can see it and view it a little bit better, which is a, kind of a nice thing. Yeah, that's terrific. So we've been, you know, little, 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 little items, little, little things about these various books, and that's what we hype in the, uh, um, in the promos. And every promo is different, and every promo has a different sort of twist to it. And um, you guys seem to make a good team. You've been collaborating now for uh, a couple of years. Yeah, it's two, about two and a half years now. You know, and we still we still do you know work, do on mo work movies together. You know, sometimes we'll work the same movie but different ends of it. Sometimes we'll end up on the same set during the same day. You know, so we're hanging out and got a lot to talk about. Um, we did a lot of this stuff when we first um, when um, we first started don't, uh, shooting. Don't look up. A cu couple of years ago, it's got two years coming up in December. We were quarantined for thirty days up in Massachusetts working on this movie. And that was when the COVID thing really got rocking and rolling. So uh, there was a lot of a lot of restrictions. Um, we were, you know, locked up in a hotel for well, 32 days, I think, by the time it was all wow. done. And we go back and forth, this, you know, from the set to the hotel. Set, hotel, back and forth. So, um, and then things were, were pretty strict then, you know, six feet separation with everybody. Everybody wearing masks. There were about, oh God, there must have been 30 enforcement, you know, health enforcement people around to make sure that, you know, you had your mask on and you kept distance and all this stuff. So they were pretty serious protocols, and you know that was our first movie. So, yeah. well, that's terrific. You know, folks, it's amazing, but uh, our our time is coming to a conclusion here. Wow, we, that went fast. Well, it, it always does, and when you've got a good guest, it even goes faster. And I want to thank you for, uh, like I say, carving out uh, an hour and joining oh. me here on City Focus tonight. It was a pleasure. Folks, you've been watching City Focus. I'm Marty Olson. I want to thank Glenn Linder for being my guest today. And uh, we'll be back next week. Good night.